What I'm about to say is going to be controversial, but I believe there are no bad people. I know not many of you are going to agree with me, but give me a chance to explain, and if you're still not convinced after watching the video, leave a comment down below with your thoughts. I'd love to know what they are. Okay, so I know what I just said was a pretty strong statement, but I have another one for you. I believe that, at our core, we're all beings of love. If you want, you can brush that off, but that's the basis of my claim that there are no bad people. So if you're not willing to entertain that idea, at least for the remainder of this video, then feel free to click off now. If you're still with me, then I want to acknowledge right off the bat that yes, there without a doubt are people who do bad things, and in fact, this probably includes all of us at one point in our lives or another. But rather than being a counter-argument, it actually brings me to my first point. How much bad do you have to do to be considered a bad person? Where is the line? Because, like I said, we've all done bad things in our lives. So does that mean that we're all unequivocally bad? Or at least that we're all bad to an extent? Some of you might think so, but I would argue that we're naturally pulled to do good and be good. And it's only when our natural way of being is blocked that we start acting barren. This is when we start to harm others, ourselves, the planet, and everything in between. So the question is, what blocks our natural way of being? In my opinion, the single largest reason, and possibly the only reason, we lose sight of who and what we really are, is not listening to our emotions. Because not listening to our emotions sends our body the message that we don't really care what it has to say or carry. Just think about it. If a kid is sad, scared, insecure, angry, or experiencing any other negative emotion, do you think telling them to stop complaining, get over it, and start being happy again would really help? Yes, I know that was the approach we had before, but did it get us anywhere? Has anyone ever really automatically snapped back into happiness after being told this? Of course not, because your negative emotions are a cry for help. They hurt so much because they need your attention. They need your care. And doing anything other than that just suppresses them and gives them time to fester. If you don't deal with your emotions, they don't automatically go away. They just build over time in the shadows, covering up who and what you truly are, until eventually you explode. You lash out, you burst out in tears, you panic, and faint. These are all physical symptoms of the emotions you didn't deal with when they first tried to get your attention. And the kid metaphor works well here too. Because when you don't give a kid attention, what do they do? They throw a tantrum. They do anything they can do to make you see them and hear them. Of course, you can ignore them further or punish them without first trying to listen to them and understand why they're acting the way they are. But that just means that next time they'll act out even more. Either that or they'll internalize their emotions and stop talking to you and trusting you as a parent. Because after multiple attempts, you've showed and proved to them that they don't matter enough for you to slow down, listen, and give them the compassion they so desperately need. This is the same thing with our emotions. If, you, if we don't pay attention to them early on, we will eventually do one of three things. One, we'll lash out and explode as our emotions find a way to escape. Two, we'll experience numbness and dissociation as our emotions will no longer feel our bodies are a safe place for them to be expressed. Or three, we'll be consumed by negative emotion, which is when you become a quote, angry person, jealous person, sad person, anxious person, etc. And the ramifications of this are huge because it means that we're past the point of being able to healthily manage our emotions and instead we've entered the very dangerous territory where our emotions manage us. This is why we have to be compassionate with ourselves just as much as we have to be compassionate with others, especially in the face of negative emotions. I think the Netflix original shows Dead to Me and Beef do a great way of showing this entire process and the extremes we can reach if we don't deal with our issues responsibly and maturely while they're still small. So if you haven't watched them yet and you have Netflix, then I really recommend you do. Plus, they're just quality shows. But in case you don't want to or you can't, I'll just say that the phrase hurt people hurt people is true. Unfortunately, it's gotten a bad rap because people think it's a justification for evil, 
which is true, that's sometimes how it's used. But that doesn't mean we have to throw the baby out with the bathwater. It means we have to add a little nuance to it. The thing is, hurt people hurt people is simply an explanation, not a justification. It helps communicate how some people are capable of doing the things they do, but it in no way should be used as a way to condone their actions or behavior. That's a linchpin in all of this, because hurt people still have the capacity to assume the consequences of their actions and take responsibility of themselves, and therefore we should expect them to. Having said this, you might start reasoning that labeling people as bad for doing bad things is only a fair consequence of their actions. But from my point of view, this is actually one of the most counterproductive things we can do for two reasons. The first is that people will act the way they're expected to act, and once they integrate something into their identity, it's very hard for them to act otherwise. So if being a bad person becomes part of someone's identity, this dramatically reduces their chances of changing their behaviors. This is the same as if you were labeled the smart kid in class, or the A-level athlete, or the prodigious musician. We naturally rise to people's expectations. The second is that it actually indirectly gives them, gives them an out. It implies they couldn't help themselves. It's like saying boys will be boys. It gives people a license to act badly as long as they're okay with being seen and labeled as bad. And actually, it's probably exactly this that made people think that hurt people hurt people was a justification, not simply an explanation. Instead, I think we should acknowledge that their actions are bad and are in one way or another harmful and expect that they do the same. From this point, some steps should be taken to remediate the situation, but more on that later. For now, I want to get back to my original point. How much bad do you have to do to be a bad person? Well, how much can be defined in two ways, frequency or severity. So let's analyze the first of these options, frequency. If frequency is the only thing that matters, then why don't you consider someone who never picks up their dog's feces a bad person? Or people who are consistently late? How about those who constantly tell white lies or omit the full truth? Hopefully these examples make clear that it isn't necessarily the frequency, or at least not just the frequency, with which people do bad things that makes them deserving of the label of a bad person in the eyes of some. So then, is it the severity? This immediately feels more accurate, so let's explore it a little further. Some of the worst things we can do is kill, rape, and steal. I have no argument there. But then, is someone who kills in self-defense a bad person? What about someone who steals bread from a store to give it to a homeless person? Are they a bad person? Is someone who rapes because they themselves have been raped or have grown up in an environment that normalizes rape a bad person? Doesn't what we define as good and bad, right and wrong, depend on the context we're in? If someone was taught since they were young that what the majority of society considers is wrong is actually right, or at least acceptable, does that just make them ignorant, not bad? Is someone who builds walls around themselves and fails to feel empathy or even sympathy bad if those walls are just a defense mechanism for the aggressions they've had to face? I would argue that it doesn't. Ignorant, maybe. Irresponsible, definitely. Bad, not necessarily. So, in some cases at least, it seems that the severity of the act isn't the only thing that matters. The context does too. But obviously the decision to kill, rape, and or to be greedy is sometimes purely self-motivated. The question then becomes, what makes murder and greed and all of the other most heinous acts we can commit as humans a justifiable act in the mind of some? I would argue that whether we're aware of it or not, the answer is always the desire to control because these acts all communicate in one way or another that you believe that you're better than the other, that your life is more worthy, that you deserve more than those around you, and that you can take what you believe to be yours or simply whatever it is you desire without worrying about how it impacts everything around you. At first, this makes it sound like these people are selfish and unempathetic. And yes, that's true, but does that make them bad? Again, I would argue it doesn't, because the search for control and the desire to exercise it over others is always based in fear. And as we've all experienced before, fear can make us do some really irrational things. 
It can make us act unlike ourselves because it makes you lose sight of who and what you really are. As Eckhart Tolle says, it always looks as if people had a choice, but that is an illusion. As long as your mind with its conditioned patterns runs your life, what choice do you have? So hopefully you see by now that what makes someone good or bad is a lot more gray than it is black or white. And this brings me to my proposed solutions, because so far I've only offered arguments against seeing and labeling people as bad. For me, the solution is to see those we've deemed as bad as humans too, and offer them the love and compassion that they can't give themselves. I believe we have to give them the opportunities and show them the path to starting to make better decisions, because if not, they will always just fall back into their old habits and routines, the conditioned patterns Eckhart speaks of. So what does this look like in more concrete terms? It looks like restorative justice. It looks like providing those who have done harm unto others, themselves, or the planet with therapy. In this way, the perpetrators can either learn to recognize their mental and behavioral patterns and gain the consciousness necessary to start regaining power over themselves and therefore stop seeking to gain it over others, or at the very least, be given access to the tools and environment that is best suited for their future success and rehabilitation. It also looks like providing victims with therapy or any other opportunities and tools appropriate to their situation to help them confront, process, and eventually overcome the violence they experienced so that they can resume life as before or as close to it as possible. Finally, it looks like offering both the perpetrator and victim support systems and safety nets so that they'll know that there are healthy, constructive options available to them moving forward. I might make another video just on this, but in my opinion, this is where our traditional prison systems fall short. They don't offer better alternatives, they just isolate the criminal, make them dependent on the system, surround them with bad influences, and spit them back out into society as if now they're somehow better prepared to integrate it into it than before. No wonder recidivism rates are so high. The point is that at the end of the day, we're all just learning as we go, and that means having missteps along the way. Without a doubt, some missteps are larger, more impactful, and yes, more destructive than others. But I truly believe that when someone commits harm, it's more a cry for help than anything else. It's them carrying out the actions that they, for one reason or another, picked up along the way. But as with anyone, being able to act as healthy members of society is simply a matter of being taught how. It's a matter of showing them that even though that might have been how they've always been viewed, they're not the scum of the earth, but rather that, like us, they too are human. If you liked this video, then you might also like the video that I'll link in the end card. I made it in an effort to explain that not only are there no bad people, but that outside of our minds, there is no good or bad period. Everything just is. Before you leave though, comment down below letting me know if you think labeling things and especially people as good or bad is ever helpful. I want this to be a space where we can all share with each other, so I really look forward to reading what you guys have to say. As for right now though, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.